Vi ska nu, innan vi presenterar nästa talare, ska vi visa en liten film om en... Ett, ni, nu har ni hört att man kan vara volontär. Men det finns också annat man kan göra i Israel som ni ska få se nu. personally invite you to join me on Walk Israel. It's great fun, it's international, and it's for a great cause, helping Israel's youth. Det här är alltså en en, ett projekt eller en idé som Kenna i Soda har haft i tre år, det fjärde året nu, att under sju års tid gå hela Schwill Israel, alltså hela den eh, promenad kan man säga, den gångväg, led, gångled, vad säger man? Ni, ser, ni märker hur mycket jag promenerar. Ja. Eh, som finns genom hela Israel från norr till söder. Och det här är fjärde året. Så att vi vandringsled. Här är en som promenerar som kan, kan. Jag har skåning, jag kan inte svenska. Är ni intresserade av det här? Det kanske någon är. Så är det alltså 3 till 8 november i år. Det finns lite follrar ute vid vårt informationsbord. Eh, vi kommer också ha med det i vår nästa tidning eh, med några och i våra nyhetsbrev framöver. Ni som är intresserade. Det är som sagt internationellt från, från hela världen och i alla åldrar är med. Så, Mikael, varsågod. Ja, då är det dags för vår andra talare, uh, Dr. Inat Wilf, and I will do it in, in Swedish. Um, you will also introduce yourself a little, I think, or no, not much. Okay. Så då, då kommer jag säga så här, vi är jätteglada att ha uh, Dr. Wilf här. Hon är, har tidigare varit en member of Knesset för uh, Labour. Hon är en politisk tänkare, varit med flertal olika think tanks och funderar mycket på hur man får fred i Israel. Vad är det som gör att det aldrig blir fred? Så det här är något som sysselsätter i Israel. Vi har pratat om säkerhet och vi har pratat om the situation. Det är de två sakerna vi har här idag och det är det som sysselsätter Israel idag. Så vår andra vårt andra pass här kommer att handla om the situation. Vad, hur kommer man vidare? Hur kan Israel få fred och vad behövs för det? Please to introduce you, Dr. Wolf. Inat, Wolf, and to the stage. And you have. I have my mic. Great. Wow, very strong lights. Okay. Well, good afternoon. It's. It's a true pleasure to be with you here today with so many committed people. It's an honor. So uh, I decided that since you hear so much about Israel and about the conflict, in the next about half hour, I'm going to settle it all for you and make it really easy. I'm going to tell you what the conflict is really about and how it's going to end. So. Thomas. So, in order to tell you a bit about that, I have to tell you a little bit about how I grew up and how I began to even think about this issue. So, I was born and raised in Jerusalem in a neighborhood called Beit HaKerim. I like to describe it as humdrum, boring neighborhood, nothing holy. You know, when people think of Jerusalem, they always think of the one square kilometer that I fondly call Insanity Central. But uh, Jerusalem is about a hundred times that size. 
and it's many residential, normal neighborhoods, and I grew up in one of them. Beit HaKerem, when I grew up in it, was very much associated at the time with the Labor Party. I would guess here would be the equivalent to the Social Democrats. The Israeli left, the Israeli labor. Where I grew up, we did not know people who voted Likud. In fact, we could not imagine that such people existed and that they were decent people. I think the two children in my neighborhood whose parents were suspected of voting Likud, we didn't play with them in our annual sukkah. So basically, we were very clear on where we stood. As I grew up and I became, uh, I adopted the views and uh, grew up into the Labor Party, I adopted what became throughout the 80s and 90s the main premise of the Israeli Labor Party. It was actually a mathematical equation, which basically said that in order to achieve peace, Israel has to hand over land. It was an equation, land for peace, really simple. Israel will hand over land it acquired as a result of the 1967 Six-Day War, the Golan Heights in the north, the Sinai Peninsula in the south, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank. It will hand over these territories and in return should expect to receive peace. Simple, mathematical. For a while, this seemed to work like a charm. I was one of the children in Jerusalem that they took out to wave flags as Anwar Sadat's, the Egyptian president's motorcade, uh, traveled into the Israeli Knesset. Shortly thereafter, Israel negotiated the classic land for peace deal. Israel handed over the Sinai Peninsula and we signed a peace agreement with Egypt. We can discuss 40 years later today whether what we have with Egypt is actually peace, but at the time, we handed over the land, we got a peace agreement. Mathematical. Throughout the 90s, there was a feeling of a domino of peace. One after the other, we were negotiating based on that formula. We were negotiating with Assad over the Golan Heights. We made peace with Jordan after Jordan decided not to claim the West Bank and we negotiated with the Palestinians towards a final peace agreement over the West Bank and Gaza. Now, I know that today many of us look back in the 90s at how naive we were, how could we have been so blind or so stupid, but for a moment, I want to remind all of us what the 90s felt like. During the 90s, everything that seemed impossible suddenly happened. The Berlin Wall fell down. The Soviet Union, that empire, collapsed like a house of cards. Remember the Sovietologists? Remember that profession? The day before they said it was impossible, the day after they said it was inevitable. So that happened. And apartheid in South Africa came to an end. Northern Ireland signed the Good Friday Agreement. So in that context, did it seem really so far-fetched that in our little corner of the world, we too might ach achieve what previously appeared impossible? And all of this, this feeling of the 90s, of the end of history, of everything is possible, came to a head in 2000, the pinnacle. An Israeli Prime Minister, on behalf of the Labour Party, Ehud Barak, goes to Camp David to negotiate with the leader of the Palestinians, Arafat, a final peace agreement to end the conflict. And he puts forth a proposal on the table, a bold proposal, some would say now reckless. A Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, capital in East Jerusalem, they could have had their state. It's on the table. And the word yes is nowhere to be heard. This happens later in 2008 with another Israeli prime minister, Ehud Olmert, gives an even more far-reaching proposal. And again, the word yes is nowhere to be heard. Now, this was very confusing 
and baffling to many Israelis. What's going on? We had a formula. It was mathematical. We hand over land, we get peace. We also made an assumption that the Palestinians were a people fighting for an independent state. We thought they were a movement of people seeking a state. And if that's the case, then why did they not say yes when they could have had a state? Because in our understanding of history, a people who want a state say yes. Now, why was this our understanding of history? Why did we make that assumption? Because this was our history, the history of Israel, of the Jewish people, of the Zionist movement. In 1947, the United Nations proposes partition to divide the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea into a Jewish state and an Arab state. Jewish and Arab, two peoples, two nations, not religions. Jewish and Arab. Now, when uh, you grow up in Israel and you hear about partition, there are certain images that are etched in your mind that are associated with that moment. We see videos in black and white or pictures of families huddled by the radio, listening to the votes being tallied from the United Nations General Assembly. Yes, no, abstain. Spontaneous eruption into horror in the streets when we understand that the vote has passed. We have the newspapers crying out, a Hebrew state, a Jewish state, Medina Ivrit. We think of it as a moment of joy. But think for a moment what the United Nations actually was telling to the Jewish and Zionist leadership. It was telling them, we, the heir of the League of Nations, the body established after the end of World War I that was responsible for carving out the Ottoman Empire to various mandates, we, the United Nations, the heir of the League of Nations, we know that you were promised by our ancestor the entirety of the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, but we're sorry, it's not working out. So you know what? You'll get half, mostly desert, the Negev Desert. And we know that you're called the Zionist movement, but no Zion for you guys. No Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Beit Lechem, 100 square kilometers, will belong neither to the Arab state or the Jewish state. And we know that you're called the Jewish people, which I believe in every language except English and French is the Judean people. You're the Yehudim, Yehudi, Yudaya, Yuda. So you're the Judean people, but Judea, the cradle of your civilization, will be almost all of it in the Arab state. So, what do you say? You get half of what you were promised, mostly desert, and the two symbols of who you are Zion and Judea are out. What do you say? And of course, in one of the most remarkable moments in the life of any revolutionary movement, the Zionist leadership says yes. Because at the critical moment, when the question was to be able to have a state, to be sovereign, but it came at a price of having much less than what we hoped for, the decision was clear. We shall have our state. We will be sovereign. We will have our liberty, and we will finally be masters of our fate. So when the Palestinians would not say yes to two in 2000 and 2008, we're not talking ancient history of 1947, to two clear and distinct opportunities to have a state of their own in the West Bank and Gaza, when they could not say yes to that, the question emerged, what do they want? What is it that they want? Because the people who want a state say yes. And not only did they not say yes, what followed 
was the descent into something that was misnamed the Second Intifada, but was really just bloody massacre. I'm sure many of you will remember. For me, growing up in Israel, this was the darkest time to live in Israel. There was a sense that if you were living, leaving your home, you were playing Russian roulette with your life. If you stood in a street and a bus passed by, you could only hope that it didn't blow up. If you sat in a cafe, it became an act of resistance because who knew if you would come back home? Entire families were blown to bits in cafes, in hotels, in the streets, in buses. Bloody massacre. And where was that happening? This was happening in Netanya, on the shore. In Haifa, on the shore. In Tel Aviv, literally on the shore. In Beersheba, in the desert. Not the settlements, not the territories, nothing controversial. Families were being massacred within what we are told is legitimate Israel, within the 67 line, minutes after the Palestinians could have had their state. So what was going on? During that time, I was uh, invited to meet Palestinians who were considered moderates. I was considered an Israeli of the peace camp, a moderate. I had checked all the boxes. I worked with Yossi Balin, the architect of the Oslo Accords, with Shimon Peres, the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. I was a member of the Labour Party that continued to support two states. I continued to support it. So I checked all the boxes of a member of the, pa of the Israeli peace camp. And I was asked to meet my Palestinian colleagues who came from the same camp. Over several weekends we met, and very quickly I realized that their moderation was a sense of resignation to reality. They told me things like, we get it, you're here, you stole our land, but you're powerful and you're here. Someone was not even so resigned. She told me, you were born here, so we will not send you away. Remember thinking, thank you. And, uh, and then we would have those discussions after dinner with a glass of wine, and they would go deeper. And they would say, but in general, the Jewish people, you're not a people, you're only a religion. Now, I know this is not the view of many people here, but I define myself as a devout atheist. Many Jews are. You do not need to believe in order to be Jewish. Jews go in and out of believing, and it doesn't make them any more or less Jewish. As I like to say, in the Ten Commandments, God asks that you shall not have another God instead of him, but atheism works beautifully. So. So Jews are first and foremost a people. But they denied that. They said, you're only a religion. And then they went on to say, and this story you made up, that this land belongs to you, you invented that story so that you could steal our own. Now, I remember thinking, one certainly does not need to believe in the existence of a god. One certainly does not need to be Jewish to appreciate that one of the most continuous, longest standing, historical, cultural, in ritual and in practice relationship between a people and a land is between the people of Israel and the land of Israel, between the Judeans and Judea. To argue that all of that was somehow invented so that at the end of the 19th century, a group of people could come to a land to which they had no connection and steal it from those who lived there, I thought that was going a bit far. And then they kind of put two and two together. They said, because you're not a people, you're not a nation, you're only a religion, you don't have the right to self-determination, the right to have the state, you're not like the French or the Swedes or the Germans or the Italians. They're a nation. They're a people. 
You're not. And certainly you don't have that right, which is the right of nations and peoples, to have a state in this land which does not belong to you and in which you have no history. Now I went back from these meetings and I thought, these are the moderates. And if these are the moderates, then the conflict is much bigger and deeper than what I was led to believe growing up, that it's about territory and all the things that are related to a territory, what we hear till today. Settlements, the 67 line, the occupation, two states, a Palestinian state. These are all aspects of assuming that this is a conflict over territory. I realized that this was fundamentally a conflict over rights. They were basically telling me that I have no right. I was an Israeli peace camp member because I recognized the Arab right to self-determination in the land. That they too have a right in part of the land to be masters of their fate. But I realized that they did not have the same equivalent position. They did not recognize my right to self-determination in the land. They were basically telling me that the day that I no longer have might, which they did recognize, is the day that I no longer have right. So this began for me a journey. I began to seek Palestinians of note who will say this. And this is five-year-old stuff. Who will say, of course the Jewish people have a history here. They are not foreigners and we're not foreigners. This is why we need to divide. They can't have all of it, we can't have all of it. Really, five-year-old stuff. And after years of writing about it, seeking, looking for a Palestinian who will say that, that the Jewish people also have a right, not a superior right, not an exclusive right, but an equal right to self-determination in the land. I found one, one remarkably courageous individual. In parentheses, I'll have to tell you, I told this story many years ago to a right-wing colleague of mine about finding that one courageous Palestinian who will say that. And he said, let me give you, tell you a joke, Enoch. Uh, two people die on the same day, one goes to hell, one goes to heaven. After a while, they meet. The one who went to hell looks emaciated, haggard, really as if he's been to hell. The other guy also looks the same way, very thin, and he asks his friend, the one who, who was at hell asks the friend who went to heaven, how come that you look like me? He said, look, I arrived in heaven and the note said, welcome to heaven, but we can't bother to cook for one person. So. So this was what my right-wing friend said about finding the, you know, the Palestinian who said, you have the equal right. So I began to think, why one person? Why only one courageous Palestinian will say that? I don't need courage to say that in Israel. I have prime ministers, parties that say that. I say, I support two states, we need to divide the land, they're not going anywhere, we're not going anywhere. I don't need courage to say that. Why does a Palestinian need courage to say the same thing? Now, I don't believe in the notion of good and evil among collectives. Maybe, maybe in individuals, even hardly. But the notion that one can say, ah, the Jews are evil and the Arabs are good, or the Arabs are evil and the Jews are good, that has zero explanatory power. So, why did the Arabs have such difficulty in acknowledging my rights? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that what we're asking the Arabs to accept is a lot. Think for a moment what we're asking the Arabs to accept. We're asking them to accept that a people have come home after 2,000 years. Now, who does that, right? With all due respect. Who comes home, knocks at the door, rings the doorbell, and says, honey, I'm home after 2,000 years? We can appreciate for a moment 
how crazy it is. Now, let me be clear. I think that Zionism is one of the world's most inspirational ideals. A people persecuted, marginalized, discriminated against for centuries, millennia, find within them the power to rise up, to claim their dignity, their equality, to restore themselves in an ancient homeland, I think it's one of the greatest stories of humanity. It's inspiring. But I do acknowledge that in this world, inspiring and insane are very close. It's a crazy idea. When Theodor Herzl published Der Judenstadt, the book, the manifesto of establishing the modern state for the Jews, it was the talk of Vienna. Vienna was a very Jewish city at the time. Everyone talked about this new book in the cafes of Vienna. And everyone agreed on one thing. Herr Herzl has gone insane. That was clear. So we need to appreciate how crazy it is. Anywhere on this earth, if a blue people came to a green people and said, honey, I'm home after 2,000 years, it would be a conflict-making situation. So that's one crazy thing we expect the Arabs to accept. But it's not just a green people and a blue people. It's the Jews. And that matters. Why does it matter that it's the Jews who are saying, honey, I'm home after 2,000 years? Because by that time, by the 19th century, the region has spent over a thousand years being Arab and Muslim, ever since the Arab and Islamic conquests of the seventh century. Now, who are the Jews in Islam? I like to say they got the first book right, but not the sequels. So, what is the position of the Jews in Islam? They can be somewhat tolerated as people of the book, but never as equals. Never as equals of the Arabs, never as equals of the Muslims. They are relegated to the margin of society. There is institutional discrimination against them. There are markers and symbols that make it clear that they are not equal. They are lower. My favorite example is that Jews in Islamic states could not ride a horse. A horse was a mark of dignity. They could ride a donkey. So it's very clear that they are not the equal. Now, these people, which the, the world of Islam and the Arab world was already used to over a thousand years of seeing them as their inferiors, as lower. Those people are coming back and looking them straight in the eye and saying, no more, we are your equals. That never goes over easily. I had a short political career, but it was long enough to learn one lesson, and I call it the only lesson of politics that matters. And this is the lesson. No one in the history of mankind ever gave up power voluntarily. Doesn't happen. If you want power, you take it. And they're gonna try to take it back from you. And when you claim equality, it means that you are demanding power, more power than you had before. I do a lot of work on comparing feminism and Zionism, showing how it's basically the same thing. Women, Jews being on a lower place in society, daring to rise up one day and claim their equality, and there is backlash. The answer is never, oh, please be my guest. There is always an effort to put, whether it's Jews or women or any other group, back where they belong. So this is the second thing we need to understand. We're ex expecting the Arabs to accept that people that they believed were already heading out of history, having failed to accept the final prophecy of Muhammad, a people lower, miserable, inferior, relegated to the margins of society, they come back as equals, as powerful, that has to be resisted. Now we're asking the Arabs to accept these two crazy ideas, the return of the Jews after 2,000 years, 
in a way that challenges their entire system of society, their legal system, their social system. And we're asking them to do so when we don't have the numbers, and they do. One of my favorite statistics is that in 1948, when Israel declares independence, there are 600,000 Jews in the state of Israel. The ratio of Jews to Arabs on Israel's independence is 1 to 50, 5 zero. So what do we do? We ask Jews from all over the world to immigrate, to make Aliyah. Great success. Over the next decades, more than 3 million Jews come. We make a whole lot of babies. Israel is the most fertile OECD country. So, great success too. We are 10 times our numbers today. The ratio of Jews to Arabs in the region today is 1 to 60. 6-0. Six so they've been busy too. So, this shows that with all due respect to babies and Aliyah, we will never procreate or immigrate our way out of these ratios. This is a dominant Arab and Islamic region, and it will remain so. So when you put these three together, this is the conflict. A people with a crazy story of coming home after 2,000 years in a way that challenges the entire civilizational structure of the dominant civilization in the region. When you understand these three elements, the Arab response emerges as entirely rational. It's not about good or evil. Of course they're going to say, who are you? Leave. Get away. What's this crazy thing? Out. Of course this is going to be the response. It makes perfect sense. It's rational. They're the dominant civilization. Why would they compromise with a small people with a crazy story that challenges everything that they are? So if this is the conflict, if this is really what it's about, how does it end? It ends quite simply based on the outcome of a race, depending on who wins that race. And it is a race that we are currently engaged in and have been engaged for over 100 years. I call it a race of mutual exhaustion. Who will exhaust whom first? They are trying to exhaust us into leaving, quite clearly, to leaving, to disappearing, through repeated military invasions, terrorism, economic boycotts, intellectual warfare, legal warfare, UN condemnations. They're trying to get us to say, seriously, not worth it, we're out of here. And that's the story they tell themselves, that Israel is a temporary foreign presence in the land. They compare us to the French in Algeria, to colonialists, to the Crusaders. The Crusaders in Arab history are important. They, la they were a Christian invasion that was repelled by the Arabs and Muslims. The, the Crusader state with Jerusalem lasted 88 years. Israel is going to celebrate 71 soon. 17 years and we're gone. So that, that is their battle. And it's rational from their perspective. And sometimes things happen that lead them to believe that we are about to give up. What are we trying to exhaust them into? We cannot, despite some crazy people in our midst, we cannot exhaust them into leaving. This is their region. Remember, 450 million Arabs, 1.2 billion Muslims, There's not, they're not leaving. This is their region. So what are we trying to exhaust them into? We are quite simply trying to exhaust them into letting us be. Into finally accepting that as crazy as our story is, we are truly an indigenous people who have come home. We are not foreigners who came to a foreign land, but people who very much in their minds 
have come home. That we belong in this region as much as they do. That our language, Hebrew, is a sister language to their own. And we are trying to exhaust them to the amazing day that they will finally say, welcome home. Now, you might listen to me now and say, okay, my God, when is that going to happen? And you just raised the bar, you know, as long as we were talking, settlements, borders, ah, you can talk about that. But to get to a point when the Arab world will actually accept powerful, sovereign Jews in its midst, they're always willing to accept us as powerless religious Jews. That's fine. But as equal, sovereign, powerful Jews, that they will tell us welcome home? How is that ever going to happen? So when people ask me when it's going to happen, I have a simple answer. I say not tomorrow and before never. Any time in between is when it's going to happen. And I do sincerely believe that as crazy as it sounds, it is a possibility. But it will only happen with two elements, power and time. We have to remain powerful over time until the point where they try to throw everything at us and they realize that we have really gotten it into our heads that we're home which is why we're not going away. In 1973, Arab armies stopped invading. They got out of the race. The Arab boycott is slowly disappearing. We are now left mostly with the UN condemnations. I'm going tomorrow to Geneva, especially to fight that. We're left with uh, our war on campuses. They're very important. And the reason that I keep fighting it it's not that only because I'm a proud Zionist, because I think this is the path to peace. The path to peace comes from ultimately standing and showing that we are home, that we are going nowhere, that we are asking no more and no less than what all other people in the world have, the right to be masters of their fate. We're asking to do that in the only country to which we ever had a connection of being our ancestral homeland, and that we are very much willing to, leave, to live in peace as equals. And I do, I always, uh, I conduct my life based on a passage from the Jewish sages, Chazal, which says, you will not finish the work, but that does not give you the right to not do it. So however long it takes, this is what I devote myself to, and I sincerely believe, however long it takes, one day they will tell us, welcome home. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is all about Savlanut have to be patient, right? Actively. So we have the solution. That's nice, isn't it? Uh, I think uh, uh, we should leave a few minutes for people to, Please do. Uh, to comment or to ask you questions. Please, anyone wants to See someone comment? Here? Yes, Max. One thought and one question. Defining the Jews as indigenous people, that's a new thought to me. Ursprungsbefolkningen, det begreppet känner vi väl till. Fascinating. Uh, the question, you talked about Palestinians and Arabs and Arabs and Palestinians. Now, Israeli Arabs, are they really sharing your perspective of the Palestinians? Um, so first of all, to your comment, yes, I think it's incredibly important to speak of the Jews as an indigenous people. It's very important, and I think it's one of the messages that we do not sometimes bring up enough, and it's one that I think is very important. Um, on the issue of Israel's Arab minority, um, I have a, an Arab colleague who gave me a beautiful quote. He says that if you want to understand the relationship between Jews and Arabs 
within Israel, within the 67 lines, within the sovereign state of Israel, you need to understand that within the state of Israel, the Jews are the numerical majority, but in their minds, they're the minority. And the Arabs are the numerical minority, but in their minds, they're the majority. Now, if you zoom out into the region, that's of course the case. The Jews are a small, small, small minority in what is a predominantly Arab and Islamic region. So this is not a regular minority. But it's not just about the region and the numbers. It also shapes a form of thinking. The Jews have spent millennia being a minority. And not just any kind of minority, a persecuted minority, a marginalized minority, a discriminated against minority, a minority that always had its fate, its life and death at the hands of others. That does something to you. That shapes who you are. Much of what it is to be Jewish was shaped by that experience. Uh, even the famous Jewish humor is in many ways a response to that experience. The Arabs do not have an experience, certainly in the Middle East, of being a minority. In many ways, it's humiliating to be a minority in a region that is theirs to the Jews. Eve, which creates a complication that is far beyond the issue of the numbers and who ma majority minority. So this complicates the relationship. And the Arabs within the state of Israel are precisely torn between this experience of being a minority in a Jewish state to understanding that there's that they should rightfully be the majority. And that complicates the relationship. Sometimes I take a step back and I say, given all the complications, it's literally a miracle that the relationship between Jews and Arabs within Israel are not worse. So I do think that over time, some good things happen. The Arabs within the state of Israel have the most favorable view in the Arab world of Jews. Granted, it starts from a very low base, but they have the most positive attitude. So they are the ones who are most able to witness the question of whether the Jews are really serious about being there. And I think over time that might have an impact. At the same time, they are influenced by the knowledge that they are part of the majority. And think what that means. If you are used to being on top, and suddenly you're a minority among those who were once lower, even if you're equal, even if you can show that all the laws are equal, something feels wrong. You feel discriminated against. There's a great phrase that goes around the internet that says, to those accustomed to privilege, equality feels a whole lot like discrimination. So, even if you could really go law by law and you would demonstrate that Israel does not discriminate against its Arab citizens, a sense of discrimination, a feeling of discrimination would still persist because in their view there is something deeply wrong with the status of an Arab minority in a Jewish state. So in a different way, that is also part of the bigger race or battle of mutual exhaustion until where we get to the point that there is an acceptance of our legitimate right to be a sovereign people in the land. Um, okay, question. Yes. You, we are talking about uh, two narratives here, the, the Jewish, the Israeli, and the, how do we how do you change narratives? What is the strategy here? Because this is uh, a, long, a long story. Okay. So this is where my background as an atheist is very relevant. Because one of the things that I recognize is that, and if you've read Yuval Noah Harari, his book, Sapiens, you will know that. The thing that characterizes sapiens, homo sapiens, human beings, is our ability to tell common stories. 
that allow us to work together. What are our common stories? The most successful common story we tell is money. If we stop believing in money, it's a worthless piece of paper. It only works as long as we all tell the story. Money is a story. God is a story. Religion is a story. Nation is a story. It's all about the stories we tell ourselves. I view myself as a storyteller of the Jewish people. We're a storytelling nation. But stories change. Religions change. Interpretations change. We can look at the history of religions and nations and peoples, and they've always changed their story. But the brilliance of those who change their story, let's say a religious leader changes a story, what they do very well is they change the story and then they say that's how it really was always. That's what God really meant. And then people say, ah, that's how it, and this is how you can begin to introduce sometimes feminism and religion or di changes. You say that's actually how to truly interpret the, the words of the text. So there is nothing in Islam, and I'm going to say something that is one of my craziest thoughts. Many of you here are Christian Zionists. Now, if you know enough about Christianity, love of the Jewish people was not always part of Christian history. Now, the, fa the fact that we have a powerful movement of Christian Zionists is testimony to the ability to reread and reinterpret ancient texts in a new light and to say, no, actually being Christian does not necessitate hating Jews. It actually necessitates loving Jews, supporting Israel. That's a massive change. And it's a change that has been very critical to the Balfour Declaration, to the support that we get in the United States today. This is an example of a massive change in one of the biggest cultural and religious systems in the world. The same can happen in Islam. There is nothing in the texts of Islam that prevents one interpreter or many interpreters of Islam saying, why do we actually have a problem with the Jews? We accept all three texts. The Jews belong in this land. This is part of our tradition. This is part of our religion. You only need to reread certain texts to say that. So the idea of Islamic Zionism, as much as I'm sure you think, okay, they really brought us someone a little crazy here, but if you look at the history of Christianity and the changes, there is absolutely no reason that such a change will happen. The change will happen as a result of interests, not because people listen to a nod and think, hmm, interesting. No, there, just like Britain became a major Christian Zionist country when it was in its interest as a result of the empire and the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire to claim its role in the Levant. So Christian Zionism became very powerful in Britain. When it becomes an interest of Arab and Muslim countries, and we're already beginning to see the very, very beginnings of it, you will begin to see people speak differently. I already collect examples. For example, last year, Saudi issued a declaration that to deny the Holocaust is un-Islamic. They issued it on International Holocaust Day. Now, was the year before denying the Holocaust Islamic? You see that they're saying something very interesting. They're redefining a value, Holocaust denial. They're not saying it's bad, unethical, not nice. They're saying it's un-Islamic. They're defining it in terms of the dominant civilization. Already you're beginning to see people go on Kuwaiti television or somewhere in Dubai and say, actually, what's the big deal? Islam believes in the three scriptures. We should accept the Jews. Still, the dominant narrative is of Israel as a foreign temporary entity that will one day disappear like the Crusaders. That's still the dominant narrative. But it can change. And it changes and it will change. Once it changes, it will not be people saying, oh, we lost to the Jews, let's go home. They will begin to change it from within. 
They will begin to describe it as Islamic, as Arab, as part of their value system, something that is honorable, something that is desirable, something that will make Islam great again. That's how they're going to tell the story, and then accepting us will be part of it, and it can be done however long it takes. But, but if you look at the scope of human history, it's done again and again and again every day. belongs to the future, but could be the very near future. Well, as a part of the exhaustion between the two nations, the Arab nations and the Jewish nation, probably will come a day when the Palestinians will, might, might, uh, declare a state without making any agreements with the Israelis. And the day after, after part of the religion stuff in their declaring of a state, or let's say dismantling the, the Hamas, they will declare what you call a financial collapse. And then they say, you guys are responsible, you take care of it, to the Israelis. How would Israel react to it? So first, we, once we understand the big picture, and this will be my last answer since I have to make a flight, <laughs> to catch an airplane. Once we understand that this is the big picture, I think everything falls into place as tactics. The Palestinian state has been declared by now, I think, five times. This country, Sweden, has recognized that state as existing. And yet, you know, we're still in that battle. In many ways, a lot of the work that I do is to come to countries like Sweden and to say, you're not helping because I know that everyone thinks that the reason, or a lot of people think, that the reason we don't have peace is because Israel is too strong, and the Arabs are small and weak, and the strong party needs to make the concessions, and we need to help the Palestinians. So let's do things for them. Let's recognize the state. Let's do all kinds of things. But the fact remains that they're not the weaker party. They belong to the dominant civilization. Nothing will change that. So they're not the weaker party. They will only become the weaker party when the Arab world and the Islamic world will begin to tell them, and some of them are, enough. Seriously, we have no more patience for that. The tragedy of what's happening right now is that the moment that the Arab world is beginning, we should not just open the champagne bottles yet, but the Arab world is beginning to move away from the Palestinian cause and to kind of tell them, guys, just say yes to something. It is countries like Sweden, Europe, students on campuses in America that are rushing in to say, oh, no, no, please, do continue, do continue. Justice is on your side, rights on your side. The Jews are evil. Israel should disappear. This only gives fuel to their side on the battle of exhaustion. It gives them fuel to not be exhausted. It gives them fuel to say, okay, we're gonna continue. We're gonna continue because these Jews, everybody hates them, so they're gonna disappear soon. And if people really want to help peace and the kind of peace where Israel is left standing, they actually need to understand what they're doing when they're fueling the other side. So a lot of tactics can be used, declaration, financial collapse, but at the end of the day, it's still the same question. Do we stand our own or do they stand? And we will not take them under our responsibility with all due respect. At the end of the day, I think we still have a very strong sense of survival. And I wanna end by saying to this whole idea of Israel is powerful, Palestinians weak, make peace by making Israel weak and strengthening Palestinians. If you want to understand one thing about the Jewish people, and I said it, is that really one thing, we're small. That's the one thing we really know. And the one thing that we do, our survival strategy, whether it's to get Nobel prizes in chemistry and physics, or to have tanks and airplanes, is a strategy which I call the blowfish strategy. We are in the business of making sure that nobody knows how small we are. We want to make sure 
that we make a whole lot of noise and we appear very powerful. Because if the world knows how small we are, we're toast. And for a moment, I'll be grim, very. One of the most devastating experiences I had in the context of the Holocaust was not when I visited Auschwitz. It's when I went to a, a suburb of Berlin to a beautiful villa on a lake. It's called Villa Wanze, beautiful. And because it's so beautiful, so peaceful, it's devastating. Because this is where the Nazi leadership comes together to detail the final solution to the Jewish question. That's the full name. Now, one document there stayed with me for years. It's like a bookkeeping page. It lists the number of Jews in every territory controlled by the Nazis, and even some not controlled, like in the UK. And it goes on to say, Lithuania, X hundred thousand Jews. Latvia, so and so Jews. Poland, so and so Jews. Hungary, and then, like bookkeepers, they sum it below and say 11 million. Now, they looked at that number and they said, that's doable. We can do that. We can have a final solution to the Jewish question. Those are the kind of numbers that we can deal with. That's what it means to be a small people. So we are in the business of making sure that no one knows how small we are. I can assure you that Prime Minister Netanyahu, when he goes around, he's like, I'm friends with Trump, I'm friends with Putin, I'm friends with Modi, look at us, Israel is a world power. I can assure you that he knows we're small. And that all of it is about making sure that no one gets into their head that we can be gone. So this is why we're often so ambivalent about the question of Israel powerful Palestinians weak. We need, in order to achieve peace, to remind people of the real ratios of that one to 60, that the Arabs and Muslims are the dominant civilization in the region and ultimately they are the ones that need to say we're done. But in the meantime, we have to appear powerful. We have to convince everyone that we're powerful. That's how we survive. That's how we get to peace. And in many ways, that is a bit of our dilemma. But by and large, I have to tell you, it is truly a relief to live in an era where Jews finally have real power. For many, many de uh, centuries and millennia, we had imagined power, right? Imagined power, we always had. But to have real power, to know that we have it, political power, military power, state power, is really a true honor uh, and a true blessing to be able to live in that era. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we all have to remember to keep the secret, okay? <laughs> the Jewish people is small, remember. Not powerful, not big, not fantastic, small. Yeah, fantastic, but small. So thank you, Einat. You have to run to a flight. Yes, thank you. Ja, har ni haft en eh, inspirerande dag idag? Ja, jag har haft det i alla fall. Jag tror vi alla har haft det eh, över som vanligt, tycker jag, varje gång. Vi är glada att eh, få hit en bit av Israel. Det är ju det. Israeldagen är ett sätt att få hit en liten bit. Idag var det en stor bit, tycker jag, eh, av Israel och få en känsla för, för vad Israel står för, både internt och i världen. Tack! för att ni kom, suttit här idag. Thank you all the guests and the speakers. Uh, Inat that, that left, uh, Doron, 
and uh, Didi and Mogs and um, uh, <laughs> I'm Ne Arnon and the Kozlovs and Einad and Antalya from Can I Sod. Thank you for supporting us and coming here and the sponsors which I mentioned before. Thank you very much. Uh, um, it was really a delightful day. And uh, I hope you can uh, spread the word. This is it. Spread the word, what you learned today. That's what's important. That's why we do this. And don't forget, we had this wonderful presentation earlier today to support and say it was really worthwhile for him to come here. And we already in the break discussed how we can work with volunteering and that Karen Hayesod can be a partner to get young people to Israel. And, and it's something we will work on. We already started that, and uh, now we got even more inspired. So thank you, everybody, and have a good uh, evening. Bye.